The subject for this evening is uh, aerodynamics for general aviation pilots. Uh, the, the subject of aerodynamics is incredibly vast, so uh, and I could never hope to cover an aerodynamic syllabus in even a month of lectures. So what we're going to talk about today are just a couple of very, very interesting concepts or concepts that you might find of interest. And where we start off with is gyroscopics. Because you cannot believe how many aerodynamic fundamentals are associated with uh, the subject of gyroscopics. What is a gyroscope? A gyroscope is any rotating mass. So bicycle wheels in motion are gyroscopes. A spinning propeller is a gyroscope. Wheels that turn on an aeroplane as you're taking off and when you are landing, those have gyroscopic properties. What are these gyroscopic properties? The two essential ones are that any spinning mass will display the property of rigidity. What is rigidity? Rigidity is reluctance to change the plane of rotation. So when you take a bicycle with the, its two wheels and it's roaring down the road, those two wheels being spinning masses have rigidity and the guy or the person that is riding that bicycle is no, no special artist. Anybody can ride a bicycle. It's not that you have to be able to balance on top of that bicycle. It's the fact that the two wheels have rigidity and they will keep the bicycle erect. I proved this concept with all three of my children. We had a huge big garden. I put them on a bicycle at the top of the garden. There was a nice downhill slope. There was a lovely soft flower bed at the end. And I gave them a shove and off they went solo on the very, very first ride down the, down the garden, across the lawn and into the flower bed. That's where they came off. But what I wanted to say is that there you saw proof of the concept of rigidity or the property of rigidity. Uh, the other one is that, that any rotating mass, if it has a force applied at a point, the, that force will transfer through 90 degrees and act at 90 degrees to where the force was applied. I have brought with me a bicycle wheel and as soon as it starts spinning it starts to display gyroscopic properties, a reluctance to change its plane of rotation and then precession. So I spin it up and it is now reluctant to change its plane of rotation and the moment I introduce a turning force over here this thing starts de behaving as if there was a tokolosh in here. I have got no control over this gyroscope. I'm going to endeavor to turn it to the right and it's going to end up pitching upwards and downwards like that. All right, so that is what we call gyroscopic precession and it lives with us in a multitude of different ways when we're operating aeroplanes. So let's have a look at the first very, very dramatic manifestation of what this is all about. Let us assume that uh, we were flying a huge big aircraft such as this Airbus A380. I've never flown this aeroplane, the biggest aeroplane in the world. I flew the second biggest. I flew the, the Boeing 747 variants. This aeroplane has 20 main wheels. The aeroplane I flew had 16 main wheels. When the time came to retract the gear, you can see here this Boeing 737-800, 
The wheels retract inwards. There are the wheel wells. This is where the wheels go. And it's exactly the same for the Boeing 747 series. Let's assume that uh, with all of these aeroplanes, the wheels retract inwards like this. Indeed, as they do with the Boeing 737-800, there you can see the wheel wells and the there's only one, there are two wheels on either side. We've got two here and two there, four wheels, and they retract inwards like this. We come back to this uh, 747. It's the aeroplane I knew best. 16 wheels. It's a fairly hot day. We're operating from Johannesburg, five and a half thousand feet above sea level. Density altitude is high, and we have a 13 to 14 hour flight ahead of us. The rotation speed, the speed at which you are going to rotate to get airborne is going to be of the order of about 175 knots indicated airspeed. The, that would give you at this altitude a true airspeed of about 195 knots, which is also the tire limiting speed. You can't take these wheels above a speed of 195 knots. That equates to about 360 kilometers per hour. That is an awesome speed to think that you're still on the ground with three to 400 people in the back and you're doing 360 kilometers an hour before the aeroplane leaves the ground. Not only do you have the 16 wheels, but each and every wheel is fitted with six brake discs. Never mind the pads, there are 12 sets of those. So you've got this incredible mass and the gyroscopic properties that are exhibited by, by rotating masses, the, 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 the level of, uh, of uh, manifestation depends on the rotational speed and also the mass. So there you have 16 wheels, 16 times 6 discs for the brakes equals 96. 96 rotating masses down there, all doing 360 kilometers per hour. And at that stage, you get airborne and you now want to retract the undercarriage and that is the way that the undercarriage retracts, not so. So where is the force being applied? The force is being applied here. What is the direction of rotation? The direction of rotation is there. Where does the force act? It, for, it acts over here at 90 degrees to where the force is applied. And what happens is that 96 wheels all branch sideways within the undercarriage pylon. Can you imagine the incredible stress that is put on those undercarriage legs? For that reason, they don't even entrust the pilot to say once he's airborne, breaks under carriage up uh, and whatever the rest of the mnemonic is. As you move the uh, gear selection lever to the opposition, so immediately a signal is sent to all of those wheels to apply brake and to bring them to a stop before there is any inward movement like that. Okay. So that is, that is one example. Let's take a look at a second example. If you look at a huge monstrous aeroplane such as the A380, the A380 has huge big engines and uh, very, very big nacelles. In fact, into each and every one of these nacelles, you could put the equivalent of half of the Springbuck Rugby forwards. You could take all eight of those forwards, and I reckon with a shove, you'd get them into this nacelle. That's how big it is. And within that nacelle, you have the N1 fan. That is the first rotor. So there's a huge fan in there. And you can imagine what speed that thing is turning at. 
inside of the nacelle. Now you belt down the runway until you're indicating about 175 knots, and that is the time to rotate the aeroplane. And airline pilots are trained never to exceed a rotation rate of more than three degrees per second. So typically, we would rotate on average to about 15 degrees body angle for the takeoff. That means that the rotation should take five seconds. Every second, you will have changed your pitch attitude by three degrees, and then the aeroplane will lift off. Okay. As you are rotating, and let's assume that from the flight deck, the engines are turning clockwise like this. The aeroplane is rotating. This is what this fan is going to do. It's going to end up in this attitude at 15 degrees from the vertical. Not so. Okay. The force is being applied here, and it is transmitting through 90 degrees, and it is acting on the side of the fan within the nacelle, and you saw what happened here when I did this. It's trying to change its plane of rotation all the time. Can you imagine what that fan is doing inside, within the nacelle? This is what is happening. So if you've done a snatch rotation, you can expect an equally dramatic deflection of these fan blades within the nacelle, and that could cause damage. Gyroscopics live within our brains all the time when we're flying an aeroplane. It's a formidable force that can be unleashed as a result of gyroscopics that you have to be aware of. Right. So that is just, those are two examples. If you're interested in aerobatics and you look at the goings on and what the unlimited aerobatic pilot of today does with their aeroplanes, gyroscopics play, play a huge, huge part in what happens in aerobatics because the movements that the pilots make in pitching and yawing Pitching and yawing are incredible, and they set up these gyroscopic precessional forces. And most of the load is taken by the propellers. So what do we have today? Instead of a two-bladed propeller, as soon as somebody gets into serious aerobatics where gyroscopics come into play even more, they fly aeroplanes that have got three blades. That helps with the distribution of forces on the propeller blades and therefore also in the hub with, where the blades are attached. So you see some pretty awesome things happening there as a result of gyroscopics to the extent that aeroplanes are actually tumbling around the lateral axis of the aeroplane as a result of gyroscopic precessional forces. Right, so we know enough about gyroscopes and gyroscopic properties, and we know enough about gyroscopic precession to be able to go on now to why it is that tail dragger aircraft are so difficult to handle. Why it is that the step from a tricycle undercarriage aeroplane to a tail dragger is such a huge big leap for pilots. And if this is because there are four aspects that conspire to spoil your day the, from the very, very first time that you attempt to take off in a tailwheel aeroplane. So let's go through them one by one. What should be fairly fresh in our brains now is the subject of gyroscopics. So we take our little tail dragger aeroplane, and I've got two of them over here. I've got a Harvard, and I've got what looks like a Cessna 140. And we commence the takeoff run, and the aeroplane is in the three-point attitude. As soon as we get enough speed for the elevators to be 
sensitive enough, we ease forward on the stick and we raise the tail so that the aeroplane goes into the flying attitude. Now, as this happens, remember, these are both American aeroplanes. The engines are turning clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. And therefore, as we push forward on the stick to raise the tail, can you see that the force is being applied there at the 12 o'clock position? Yeah, at the 12 o'clock position. Engine turning clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. Force is transmitted to a position 90 degrees removed from the point of application, and there is where it will act. Applied at the top 12 o'clock and acting at the 3 o'clock position, and whoops, the aeroplane starts yawing off towards the left. As you push forward on the stick, boom, because of gyroscopics, the aeroplane starts yawing and it goes off to the left and you have to apply right rudder. So that is the first, there's a gyroscopic effect. The second is that there is a torque reaction from the propeller. Now the torque reaction, a torque does not yaw the aeroplane, torque rolls the aeroplane. If you had to start the engine of your motor car and you opened up the bonnet, and you got somebody to rev the engine, and you looked at that engine, you'd see from the, 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 uh, the radiator fan what the direction of rotation of the engine is, and as you apply power and bleep the engine, you will see that the engine turns opposite to the direction of the cooling fan that, that you're looking at. All right. And you can see that the, there is an opposite reaction. So what happens over here is we've said once again that the propeller is turning clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. The aeroplane will roll anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise. Where is the greatest manifestation of this? Where do you see this with, the, with your own eyes? You see this at air shows when all of our unlimited pilots, of whom we've got about four or five, flying their extras and their uh, 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 MX2s, etc., etc., they pull to the vertical, they set up a little bit of a roll, all right, so that the aeroplane has some inertia opposite to the direction of the propeller, and when the aeroplane stops, when it actually stops because it can go no, no further, it's run out of energy, the engine is belting away, propeller turning this way, and the aeroplane does a torque roll backwards. Torque rolls the aeroplane, it does not yaw the aeroplane. Okay, so why is this a factor during the takeoff run? The reason it is a factor is that with the propeller turning this way, the left wheel digs into the ground. It digs in. It has more resistance than the right wheel, which is tending to actually come off the ground. And because there is more rolling resistance from the left wheel, the aeroplane starts yawing off towards the left. So there is a torque reaction. Okay, that rolls the aeroplane, that causes it to yaw. Have I ever seen this before? It is so slight that you don't really pick it up. You pick it up if you happen to be taking off on a beautifully smooth runway, which is nice and wide, and you aren't bumping around, etc., etc. So you're taking off from from a, a top-notch airport, and there you can actually see, even in the Harvard, that the left wing is slightly lower, that there is more pressure on that left wheel than on the right wheel. And also, you're going to find that this, in time, this left wheel, the rubber is going to wear away quicker than it is from the right wheel. The, the most dramatic manifestation I have ever seen of this torque reaction on the ground when taking off 
is in the Spitfire. But in the Spitfire, that had a number of blades, all right, so there was a lot of mass and turning at a fairly high RPM, and you had 1,500 horsepower there. None of this 250, 300, 400 horsepower nonsense. 1,500 horsepower, and you could actually feel that wheel dig in. You actually went down the runway with a lot of bank from the torque reaction. Once again, which rudder would we need? We would need the right rudder. So we've looked at the gyroscopics. We've looked at the torque reaction that is causing you to yaw to the left. And the next thing is what we call asymmetric blade effect. Now, it's very difficult for you to see there, but if you look side on, side on over here at this propeller, the leading edge of the propeller here, this right-hand blade, this is the blade that is going to be the down-going blade. It's turning clockwise, as viewed from the cockpit. It is the down-going blade. The leading edge of the propeller is ahead of the trailing edge because of the, the pitch of the propeller. And if you look in there, you can see that, that the angle of attack of this blade, the down-going blade, is higher than the angle of attack of the upward-going blade there. The higher the angle of attack for the same speed, the greater the production of lift, therefore the greater the force of thrust there is. And what is going to happen is that the right-hand blade is going to be generating more thrust than the left-hand blade. That is what we call asymmetric blade effect. And the aeroplane is going to want to yaw to the left as well, which means that you need right rudder. So there are three things that are conspiring against your ability to keep the aeroplane straight. Finally, we have what we call slipstream effect. Air has mass. Any body that has mass that is in movement has inertia. If we impart a, a, a rotational movement to this mass of air that is coming from the propeller, it will not come directly backwards linearly in a straight line. It will form a helix, like a whirlpool behind the propeller. And what happens is that airflow comes down the right-hand side of the fuselage over here. It passes underneath the fuselage, and it is still twisting and turning, and around it comes and it strikes the left-hand side of the fin of the aircraft here, like that. A helical flow of air. It's called slipstream effect. And that slipstream effect strikes the tail, causes the nose to go, amazingly, to the left. What rudder do you need? You need the right rudder. So all four of those things work against the tendency of the aeroplane to just to track straight down the runway. As you push forward on the stick, as you open the throttle, as you get going, this aeroplane has a mind of its own and it wants to go to the left. Got it. Okay. To a lesser extent, once you have landed, if you've wheeled the aeroplane onto the ground like that, as the tail drops towards the ground like that, then what happens is that the gyroscopics work in the opposite direction. They work in the opposite direction, but they're still there. Now your aeroplane is going to yaw suddenly to the right, and you're going to have to correct with a little bit of left rudder. Okay, the rest of the, rest of the things aren't really there. The slipstream effect is gone because the throttle is back. There's very little torque reaction because the throttle has been pulled backwards, right? It's just at idle power. It is the gyroscopics. Now, if, if you really want an exciting day or an exciting landing on your hand, then you will touch down in a pit special, for example, which is very closely coupled, very closely coupled. So it is skittish around the vertical axis. In other words, in, in the yawing plane, it is very, very skittish. 
And if you allow the tail to bounce like that, one moment you're getting a gyroscopic effect going that way, and then you've got a gyroscopic effect going that way. And then you really struggle to keep up with this little aeroplane. It is going to win the battle and do what it wants to do at the end of the day, unless you can actually pin the tailwheel to the ground, then you are just left with one set of rules instead of rules that are changing all of the time as the tail bounces up and down. Okay, so those are the four big aspects that uh, make operations in tailwheel aeroplane a lot different to those that have tricycle gears. So, as I said, this uh, uh, aerodynamics is a very, very vast subject. We're only just touching on two or three concepts. And uh, what I see in many of the pilots that I fly with is that they use the rudder incorrectly when turning. They either don't use the rudders at all or they use them incorrectly. And a lot of people actually think, a lot of pilots actually think, that uh, you turn with a rudder and not the aileron, or you apply rudder first and then the aileron, whereas in actuality, the way that an aeroplane is turned is it's turned by using the ailerons. And a byproduct of the use of ailerons is the fact that rudder has to be used thereafter. So let's see why it is that we say that it is the aileron that turns the aeroplane. Here we are in straight and level flight. Aeroplane weighs a certain amount. It is exactly balanced by the lift. The instant that we put bank on, the lift vector remains at 90 degrees to the aircraft, the wings and the rest of the aircraft at that's where it is, and as you apply this bank with the tilted vector, you are able to break it up into two different components. There is the vertical component, which continues to oppose weight, and if that component, the vertical component, a component, a part, not the whole vector, just that part, is exactly the same as the length of the weight vector, the aeroplane will maintain its altitude. But at the same time, there is a horizontal component that comes off this main lift vector. The horizontal component is what provides centripetal force, which we called in Afrikaans, Middelpunt-Sukundekrach, the force that looks for the center of a circle, and that is what turns the aeroplane. So it is aileron that turns the aeroplane primarily. What did we say about the requirement for rudder? That is a byproduct. So let's see why. Here we have these the aeroplane, as I said, in straight and level flight, and the ailerons are dead neutral. Aeroplane is perfectly, perfectly rigged. As we roll in, we are reducing the lift on this wing by putting the aileron up, up aileron there, down aileron there. Okay, and as that happens, so this aileron has moved into an area where the pressure is less. Lower pressure over the top of the wing, we won't get into an argument about that, we'll accept that. But what we're saying is that the definition of pressure is the force per unit area. There is the area of a flight control, okay? And the force on that flight control, where the wing is going down, is less than the force on this aileron where the wing is going up because the aileron is going down into the, pre the high pressure area 
high pressure means greater force per unit area and as you have rolled in what has happened is this wing the upgoing wing with the downgoing aileron is experiencing more drag than on this side of the aeroplane so you roll in and look what happens the aeroplane the aeroplane yaws around its vertical axis and opposes the direction of the turn. So you roll in and that's what happens. What do you see in the cockpit? You see that the ball has gone out to the right. And for some it's monkey see, monkey do. There the ball is, follow the ball. Treat it as a... Uh, Treat it as, uh, as if it were a soccer ball. If it's out to the right, use your right leg to, to kick it back into position. If it's out to the left, use your left leg to, to apply rudder to get it back into position. But what actually happens is the nose moves away. All you as a pilot have to do is oppose that yawing moment around the vertical axis of the aeroplane by applying rudder in the same direction that you have applied aileron. First the aileron, and because you've upset the apple cart, a little bit of rudder to stop that yaw. In other words, to keep the aeroplane balanced. And you will see that the ball is in the middle. How much rudder do you actually need to give? I always say that the finest instrument in the cockpit is actually the windscreen. I'm not a guy that flies around with my head in the cockpit, nor should anybody be. You should be looking outside. That's why you learn to fly. It's so nice looking outside. You see so much looking outside. So look outside for your answer. And that is as the aeroplane rolls and yours away from the turn, just ensure that you give enough rudder to assist the aeroplane in its turn. The instant that the bank comes on, the aeroplane should in fact be turning together with it. I know it's difficult looking at it this way, but it's, it's a hell of a lot more difficult for me to try and explain this with the aeroplane coming in this direction. So I hope you're getting, you, you're, 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 you're understanding this. Let's try this again. We're going to, we're going to, let's say, turn to the left this time. We want this wing to come down. That aileron goes up. That aileron goes down. As the aeroplane rolls in, this is the one with the greater resistance, the greater drag. The nose moves so as to oppose the roll in of the aeroplane. And that is what we call either aileron drag, some people talk about aileron drag, other people talk about adverse aileron yaw. It is aileron yaw. It's the, it's, it's the, it's the ailerons that, 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 that is causing this yaw. So as the aeroplane does that, what do you do? You give a little bit of left rudder in sympathy to bring the nose back and to have a happy situation where the aeroplane is turning nicely. So what did we say? First the ailerons and then the rudder in the same direction. Either if you like looking inside and to an extent you do look and do a scan every now and then you make sure that the ball is in the middle or you just have a look and see that as you apply the bank the aeroplane is actually turning in sympathy with the amount of bank that has been applied. Okay. The same holds good when you roll out of the turn. Here we are in a turn to the left. Lower, the left wing is the lower wing. That aileron is up, yes. That aileron is down. The aeroplane tended to yaw away from the direction of turn because of the adverse aileron yaw. We applied left rudder to bring the nose back into position and we're in a balanced turn. Now we want to come out of the turn. We are going to give a right aileron. That aileron is going up. Yes. Okay. That one is going down. That's the one with the drag. Here. 
the adverse aileron yaw is going to be primarily yeah, from this left wing. And as the aeroplane rolls out this way, it's rolling right, but what's it doing? It's yawing left. How do we stop it yawing left? We give a little bit of right rudder in sympathy with the aileron. But first the aileron and then the rudder. The rudder input. The bottom line is that any, any, any time, any time there is an aileron application, there needs to be a rudder application in sympathy. Now there were some aeroplanes. I think there were the early model tripaces. I'm talking about in the 1950s. There was another aeroplane called the Urkoop where they had the ailerons linked up to the rudder pedals so that pilots didn't have to actually have to make an application on the rudder pedals. This was done automatically. As you did this with the stick, so the rudder moved in sympathy. There was a, a tie-up and a link-up. Didn't work that well. Not if you were a purist, and not if this really meant something important to you, and also that if you were flying the airplane in a spirited manner, where a lot of aileron was required. A lot of aileron means a lot of rudder as well. I never ever bought into what they produced then in the 1950s. I don't like this link up. Basically, this is what the way that pilots should be taught to fly and the way that they should fly is that every time they apply the aileron, they must be mindful of the fact that rudder has to be applied as well. And so you embark on a cross country flight with certain people and they do not use the rudders properly. I've seen this across the spectrum. I have done flights in the Douglas DC-3 Dakota where you have pilots sitting there, their legs may as well be amputated except for the takeoff and the landing. The rest of the time they are flying the aeroplane like this hot turbulent day in a DC-3 Dakota with 30 people in the back of the aeroplane and every time an aileron input is made, right aileron, there goes the nose to the left and then left aileron and there goes the nose to the right and those in the back of the aeroplane are swishing around like this and it is not long before the air sickness bags come out. Never mind in the Dakota, never mind in the Hawker Sidley 748, all those aeroplanes that flew around in the bumps at 10, 11,000 feet. Never mind those aeroplanes. Even your general aviation aeroplanes, Comanches, Centurions, Bonanzas, V-tail Bonanzas, everybody turns around. So many pilots turn around and they say, hell no. I'm not going to get the V-tail Bonanza because that thing yaws through the sky like this. All that they are telling you is that they are pilots that have never learned how to use the rudders properly. Bottom line, you apply aileron, immediately there is a commensurate application of rudder and that aeroplane will fly through the sky as smoothly as if it was operating on silk. So we understand that stick and rudder live together totally, completely and absolutely. And you should never get into a situation where you are out of phase with the use of the rudders because that leads to a cross-controlled situation. And when we cover spinning and stalling later on in the syllabus, in our syllabus that is, what you will see there is that a cross-controlled situation which leads to an unbalanced situation can ultimately lead to the onset of an incipient spin and thereafter a spin. You never fly, never fly out of balanced and you never fly cross-controlled and you always use stick and rudder simultaneously. I said to you a little earlier that there were various gadgets that uh, that were invented to try and get the uh, 
uh, rudders to operate in harmony with the with the aileron so that the aeroplane was always balanced and I told you that they didn't work that well but there are design features there are features built into the aeroplanes to try and minimize this aileron drag or adverse aileron yaw and basically two design features come to mind that have proved to be fairly successful in the modern day aeroplane and the one is what they call differential ailerons what do they mean by the differential aileron remember that the upgoing aileron is going into an area of low pressure where the force per unit area on the aileron is less and where the adverse aileron you're resulting from this is not as bad as it is for the aileron that is moving downwards this is the culprit this is the one where all the drag most of the drag is generated so what they do is the, the designers through an advanced set of design features that work well and last a long time they come up with a situation where the downgoing aileron does not go down as far as the upgoing aileron so for any movement of the aileron it is the upgoing aileron that will go up more than the downgoing aileron and vice versa which takes out a huge amount of this adverse aileron yaw that I've been talking about and it, it requires only a lighter touch on the rudder pedals you don't have to give that much rudder it's made it easier for the pilot made it easier because of the differential here if you go back to the, a tiger moth they were flying around in the 1930s and you move the stick this way and you move the stick that way you will see that they have differential ailerons already in the 1930s they were producing such aeroplanes they worked off a different sort of camshaft system whereby the aileron went down to help you with the initiation of the turn and then it actually came back slightly very very clever for that era it helped to a certain extent so we talk about differential ailerons difference in the amount that they move up or down always less down than they do going up they talk about freeze ailerons and a freeze aileron is an aileron that is hinged so that the leading edge of the aileron will protrude into the slipstream when the aileron goes up remember the upgoing aileron is the one with the least drag compared to the one that goes down so the aileron that moves upwards has a leading the hinge is set backwards from the leading edge of the aileron it's set backwards so that part of this aileron sticks out into the airflow it's called a freeze aileron so not only is this aileron up here in the slipstream but the other thing is that it is picking up a lot more drag here from its leading edge and the sum of the two drags hopefully is close to the drag of the downgoing aileron on its own that's called a freeze aileron in the airline industry they get even more clever firstly sticking purely with aerodynamics these aeroplanes have got huge huge wingspans look at that huge wingspans so what happens is that they re, they there's a lot of what they call aerodynamic damping as roll is applied these the movement of the wings is damped by the huge amount of air that is coming the relative wind from both the top and the bottom there is an aerodynamic damping so what they do here we're going to take this airliner and we're going to bank it to the right this aileron is going to go down it's got the most drag 
The nose is going to want to do that. But the aeroplane is reluctant to roll because of the damping. Okay, so what they do is they put a spoiler over here. And the spoiler does two things. As you apply the aileron to the right, a spoiler jumps up out of the wing and it spoils the lift, it reduces the lift. If you've got reduced lift on this wing, what's going to happen? It's going to continue the roll towards the right. Not so. That's what the spoiler is there for. It kills the lift. Zoop! And the aeroplane rolls a little bit faster. And the other thing is, what does that spoiler do in moving up? Does it, does it uh, uh, create more drag? You bet. It creates more drag. So instead of the aeroplane yawing this way, the drag brings it back into position. It both rolls nicely because of the spoiler destroying some of the lift, and it has more drag. Yeah, the aileron went down. This is the high drag aileron, but here you've got extra drag from the spoiler. Shoop! And the aeroplane turns very, very nicely. How much rudder do you have to give? None. It's been worked out so beautifully. How do you fly this aeroplane? You fly it on the stick. You don't even touch the rudders. You don't have to. Because they've designed them out of the equation with their fancy gadgetry. And all the more reason why when this fellow that is flying an airliner gets out after a day's flying and gets into his Piper Cub or his Pit Special or his Piper Cessna or Beechcraft or Cirrus or whatever it is he's getting into. He must know that from that point onwards it's back to harmonized stick and rudder. Okay. There's one other little gadget and that is what they call a yaw damper. If there is any yaw present, if any yaw occurs, if this spoiler isn't doing a good enough job, if the freeze ailerons aren't doing a good enough job, if the differential ailerons are not doing a good enough job, then a yaw damper will, through the automated system of the aeroplane, or whatever system has been installed, that will see to it that enough rudder is applied. It will apply rudder, the yaw damper. And you can switch a yaw damper on, and you can switch it off. And some aeroplanes have them, but most don't. And what is that yaw damper? It's a rate gyro. So it, it, it works on the same principle as a, a turn and slip indicator. The turn indicator, not the slip. The slip is the ball, but the turn indicator. And you've all been shown, and you all know, and you've all used the turn indicator over and over and over again. Well, that's what the yaw damper does. It, it's the same sort of gyroscopic system that uh, picks up the, a rate of yaw and applies a little bit of aileron in the correct direction. The other factor that comes into play here is that the ailerons are removed completely. That part of the wing, that part of the wing is removed entirely from the slipstream from the propeller. Let's just have a look at the elevators and the rudder. They are directly in the slipstream area from the propeller. At low speeds with high power, they've still got a huge amount of airflow over the elevators, over the rudder, and these will remain relatively sensitive. At low speed, when the control effectivity is becoming less and less, if at low speed you have got high power, you have still got great response from these uh, flight controls, elevators and rudder. Here, the ailerons are way outside of the slipstream from the propeller. So what happens here is that at low speed, the ailerons are very, very sluggish. At high speeds, they are sensitive and firm, and a little bit of aileron application goes a long way. 
Okay, if you are in a climb and you are wishing to do a climbing turn, a climb is synonymous with low speed, low airspeed. So you're in the climb and you apply aileron. The, you can expect the ailerons to be fairly sluggish and a lot of aileron is required to go a short way. But as this as you apply the aileron and a lot of it, you are going to experience adverse aileron yaw and you are going to need rudder in the same direction. But what can we say about the effectivity of the rudder? The effectivity of the rudder is good. It's still very good because you've got this engine belting out full power and sending so much air back past the tail. So you have a situation where the control feel is mismatched. The moment that you throttle back and you convert the climb into a glide at the same speed, at the same speed, there's no change to the aileron feel, but there is certainly a change to the amount of rudder that is required now. So this also implies that when you come into land and you have throttled back completely and you are utilizing the ailerons to turn onto the center line of the runway, it also implies that because there is no huge slipstream over the tail, the rudder movements are going to become greater. And if you're flying a tail dragger and you're hoping to keep this aeroplane straight, remember that the rudders now are of vital importance. They feel completely different on the landing roll because for a certain low speed there is very little airflow over the elevators and the rudder. Whereas on the takeoff when you've opened up the throttle at that same low speed the rudder is very sensitive and so are the elevators. So I've given you enough to chew upon. It's time for a little bit of a break now. And remember that I'll be available for questions after the, uh, and, I, and I hope answers, questions and answers uh, after the presentation has been completed. In a few minutes time, we'll be introducing you to our guest for tonight. This is none other than Sean Thackray. For those of you that don't know who Sean Thackray is, Sean Thackray is a pilot that learned to fly on Harvard's in the military many years ago. From Harvard's he flew Impalas. After Impalas he went to the fighter squadrons. I'm not too sure whether he flew Mirages or not, but he'll tell you. But he certainly flew the Cheetah uh, which was which was an offshoot and and uh, an improvement on the on the Mirage. He flew cheetahs for a long, long time, and uh, he flies for the uh, Flying Lions aerobatic teams, where he flies Harvards as the soloist, and he flies as a wingman on Pitts specials. So he is certainly a guy that knows his oats. He's also a very, very talented aviation artist, for those of you uh, that, that didn't know that. So Sean's going to be speaking to us, and I think almost as a first, perhaps anywhere in the world, what's he going to be talking to us about? Air-to-air -air refueling because this is something that he did on many an occasion. So he's going to talk to us on the very, very exciting subject of air-to-air -air refueling. Before I uh, hand over to him, uh, I need to just explain a couple of aerodynamic concepts once again because these will play a part in his presentation and he will be reinforcing what I have just, what, what I'm about to talk to you about. The first is the lift formula. We know that in 1G straight and level flight, the sum of all the lift 
compressed into one lift vector should equal the weight of the aeroplane. Lift must equal weight for the aeroplane not to gain height, to lose height, to stay in 1G flight. Right. Now, there is a formula that is written for the generation of lift. And we call it glibly the lift formula. The lift formula is that lift must equal, should equal weight for 1G flight, but that that lift equals CL, which is the coefficient of lift, half rho, which is the density of the air, V squared, which is the square of the speed, and S is the surface area. Lift equals CL half rho V squared S. There is nothing that we can ever do about uh, the, uh, the density of the air unless we are looking at swept wing jet aeroplanes, etc., etc. To all intents and purposes, the surface area of the wing remains, remains constant. Speed is something that we can change with great effect at any time. Any, when I said with great effect, effect on the amount of lift that is being generated. You can increase your speed and the lift increases as the square of the speed or you can reduce the speed and it will reduce as the square of the speed. Okay, so we, we can't change the density of the air. To all intents and purposes, we cannot change the surface area of the wing. And uh, we can therefore only change the speed. And usually if we've set up the power, that is the speed we want. Okay, so we don't go about willy-nilly changing the speed, but any time that the speed does change, you either have to increase the amount of lift by increasing the angle of attack of the aeroplane or reducing the angle of attack of the aeroplane. And that is where CL comes in. And what do we mean by a coefficient of lift? What is a coefficient? Well, you get all sorts of coefficients. You get coefficients of heat, the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a certain material by a degree or two in temperature. How much heat do you need? Some items require a huge amount of heat to raise their temperature, others don't. Some items keep their heat, others don't. For example, if you order toasted sandwiches and one of those sandwiches has a slice or two of uh, tomato in it and those sandwiches are all, all put in an oven given the same amount of heat and, and uh, for a same, the same amount of time the chances are that you'll pull a sandwich out of the oven and eat that sandwich there and then until you get to the sandwich that has got the tomato in it. And in the instant that you take a bite, you are going to scald your tongue and you are going to run around there with a very, very sore tongue because you've burnt it. Because once again, for it. Example, it is the tomato that has a higher coefficient of heat than anything else that you've put into that sandwich. The chicken or the butter or the margarine or the, or the, or the slice of meat or whatever, it is the tomato that is the one that has got the highest coefficient of heat. You can talk about the coefficient of expansion. And that is where you have two identically sized metals, or even three, that are put alongside each other and given the same amount of heat. One will expand more than the other two. Or all three might expand differently because they have different coefficients of expansion. Okay, when it comes to lift, the coefficient of lift is, it is just a number. 
And there are hundreds of aeroplanes out there, all with different aerofoils. So they all generate lift in a different manner. But within a group of aeroplanes where you have the identical plan form and the identical area. So you take, this looks like a Cessna 170 to me. You take a whole lot of Cessna 170s, all with the same wingspan, all with the same area and exactly the same layout, what we call the plan form. Exactly the same, except that they have different curvatures, different curvatures, different aerofoil sections. One is curved more than the other, or one has got uh, vortex generators or some high lift uh, uh, gadget on the wings to, to change the ability of that particular wing to generate lift. Then, within that group with the same sort of wings, you have different coefficients of lift. At various angles of attack, this is the wing. Same plan form, same size, same layout, but with the aerofoil section for this particular angle of attack, one wing will generate more lift than the other. So it is specific to vegetables, all right, that are in the sandwiches or components of a sandwich, or the type of metal that you have, which one expands more than the other, bronze, steel, aluminium, copper, whatever. Same size, exactly the same size, same layout, same everything, same amount of heat, which one expands more? Which one delivers more lift? That's where the coefficient of lift comes in. And that number that is allocated, the records will be kept of that particular aerofoil, how much lift it generates for a change in aerofoil section. So when we come to air-to-air -air refueling, where that fighter that Sean happened to be flying was getting low on petrol and weighing very, very little, okay, was now taking on fuel, what did he have to do to ensure that he stayed buckled up with his probe and the basket that came out of the tanker? I hope I haven't given away too much, but I'm just so that you understand what some of the aerodynamic concepts are, it, it'll be over to him shortly. The final one being, did you hear me talking of earlier on about aerodynamic damping? Well, he's going to tell you all about flying in formation to within a couple of centimeters this way or that way at high altitudes where the damping barely exists. And it takes a mighty fine pilot to be able to cope with an air-to-air -air refueling. So Sean is going to give you a talk that is full of excitement. Please remember that once he's completed, I will be here to answer any questions that you might want to ask me. Good evening, Sean. It's terrific having you here on the show. Uh, although we fly weekend in and weekend out together, uh, we fly Harvards together with the Flying Lions aerobatic team, we fly pit specials together and, and we share some terrific times doing the things that we do, flying around the country, entertaining people. But to have you here in the studio is, uh, is really a great pleasure and a great honor to have you here to talk to us about a fascinating subject, really fascinating, and that is air-to-air -air refueling. When was it that, uh, that you started learning how to do this air-to-air -air refueling and how much experience do you have? I was very fortunate, Scully. I, uh, 
I started to fly cheetahs in the SAF in the early 1990s when 60 Squadron came online with the 707s. And it was pretty much par for the course that everybody who flew cheetahs would have to do air-to-air -air refueling. And I uh, looked in my logbook this morning and I saw that I had already started air-to-air -air refueling with only 22 hours on cheetahs. It was normal. That was, it was just something that we had to do. So the, the air to air refueling requires that the epitome of uh, station keeping information. You've got to bring this down to about uh, 20, 25 centimeters to get into position and maintain that. Is that right? Well, in, in fact, it's, it's a step further because you have to fly into another airplane, which uh, seems entirely counterintuitive. Uh, but you've got to make contact. And uh, that's one of the hurdles to overcome. But I'll discuss that when we get to the conduct of the sortie. So I think let's get into that. Uh, you've right from the word go as to how you effect the rendezvous, how you get four or five aeroplanes into position at the same time. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is basically take us through an air to air refilling sortie. Let's say we, uh, we've done a strike somewhere far away, typically we would have gone Louis Trichot to Luatla, and we've completed the strike, and now we'd like to take on fuel to have a safe recovery back to Louis Trichot. It's a long way to go, and uh, sometimes things happen, you're still carrying bombs, and you need that little bit of extra gas. So we come off the target, and there's a pre-arranged rendezvous point where the Boeing will be holding. Uh, Mad Max, my call sign, my formation, with four cheetahs, is now looking for Eagle, which would be the OC of 60 Squadron, and he is sitting in a holding pattern. We've got this programmed in our navigation system, and I fly towards the point and turn on my air-to-air -air radar. And then when we have what uh, is still termed Judy, which is a lock-on to the target with our onboard radar, then we inform him that we're closing in on him. Standard arrival at a 707 is from a thousand feet below, and we will form up with all four aircraft in an echelon formation on the right-hand side. That's standard NATO procedure. Can I ask you what height is the mothership holding at? Typically uh, 15,000 feet at 300 knots is our ideal refueling. You might ask yourself why 300 knots? It's VIND for a Delta Wing fighter. And so we've got maximum excess thrust available and we can maneuver as necessary. But altitude wise, the 707 could go basically from ground level all the way up to about 25,000 feet. And then you start to run out of the power that you need to do this effectively. And is he staying in a holding pattern or is he traversing uh, from, from west to east, north to south? What is he doing? Good point. So initially, while he's waiting for us to affect the rendezvous, he sits in a holding pattern, um, which would be a tight hold, maybe a minute leg, or even uh, if necessary, just in an orbit until we say we locked up and we're joining then he will go into um, the refueling circuit, which is essentially a racetrack course. And you can decide for yourself what are reasonable legs. Obviously you want to do a lot of your refueling straight and level. And uh, most refueling takes about two minutes. How many baskets come back at one time? Okay, this is a, a good point. So let's say we've now joined up and everybody's happy that the safety is correct. We do a thing which, strangely, uh, the, the, the command was Frey Start, air to air. Can you believe it? The South African code names. That meant we do our checks. We check that all of our weapon systems are safe and that we're in the correct head up display. So I inform them that we are now ready to refuel and they, they trail the baskets. Normally, two baskets will come out from. Uh, if I may demonstrate here with our supposed 707, and they come from wingtip stations. So you get one from each wingtip station. There is a basket in the center of the fuselage, but that was generally used for emergencies. Right, so at any time, two guys are being refueled. So two of you are homing in, and two of you are holding 
nearby. On the right hand side. On the right hand yeah. side. You said that you so were in a, echelon. Yes, the whole point is that you echelon on the right until you cleared in. Then the recipients may move to behind their station and the other guys wait. And then when you completed, you move off to the left. So there's a logical flow uh, that, that everybody always knows what's happened. Who is still waiting to refuel and who's done. You said this takes uh, as little as two minutes. So uh, talk to us about, about homing in on that basket. Uh, Scully, this is the moment where the magic happens. So you're sitting just short of the basket and uh, fluid dynamics in water as in the air means that you are actually generating a bow wave ahead of your aircraft, even though it's, it's quite close to the airplane because air compresses more than water. So uh, the effect is only seen when you get right up to the basket. And so you sitting a meter behind, you put the probe a little bit to the three o'clock because you know what's going to happen next and you start closing in. The basket, feeling the effect of the bow wave, now starts to move up and away which is very disconcerting because it means that you're probably going to miss. But you have to ignore this because you know it's going to happen. You're normally being watched by your squadron mates. More often than not, 30 or 40 spectators in the 707 and the pressure to perform is immense. <laughs> like this, an air show. It's much like an air show. Yeah. So this is a moment that's best left for practitioners of yoga and martial arts. It's a Zen moment. You have to ignore the basket. So what you do is you, uh, you look at your fixed cross in the head-up display, which is the thing that doesn't move, and you stick it onto a position on the refueling probe, and you ride that straight in until the, until the probe makes contact and, uh, and goes solidly into the basket. Can I stop you right yeah. there? Are you looking at the probe and trying to fly the probe into the basket or are you the way that you would fly formation aerobatics you're looking to keep your wingtip right on uh, the, the leader's wingtip or to, to maintain a definite position looking at something on the aeroplane or are you looking through the head-up display at, uh, uh, at a computer-generated image. Yeah, this, is, this is exactly the difficulty. You specifically do not want to look at the probe or the basket because in the cheetah, they are positioned awkwardly off to the side. And as I said, you know the basket's going to move and you want to ignore that because as soon as you get past a certain point, the bow wave no longer affects it and the basket comes back at you. And if you try and formate on the basket, you're going to miss. So the Zen is look up at the fixed cross, computer generated, and fly it on a reference on the 707. Ignore everything else. And you generally then meet success. And then is there an audible thump or is there an electronic signal that says, okay, you're, you're, you're connected, you're hooked up? You, there's no doubt when you've made good contact. The, the probe, when it goes into the basket, it goes into a locking mechanism um, on, the, on the actual basket receptacle. Uh, there are bearings that are spring-loaded that, that kind of clip into a ring on the probe itself. And you hear a clonk and you know, oh yeah. I've done it. That's the moment. <laughs> right. Which is much better than the other when the basket then whips past and you've missed. Right. Which of course does happen. So, clonk, you know you're in and you keep your momentum going because you need to push the basket back in towards the tanker. There are marks on the hose that then indicate that you are in the refueling range of the pot. Then who opens the tap? Ah, so they're ready for you at that stage. You initiate all those things. You get it into the refueling range. And all you have to do on the throttle, you press a button and it depressurizes your fuel system and the fuel starts flowing. If you're on one of the wing pods, it'll flow at about 1500 liters a minute, uh, which is spectacular. I mean, that's, that's a lot of fuel. And um, as you can imagine, now you are getting heavier 
And the trick is to keep the airplane uh, nicely in position, uh, navigate, well, not navigating, formating on, uh, on the probe and on the airplane itself. And as you get heavier, so your angle of attack increases for the same speed, and um, obviously the drag increases, so you've got to be increasing power as well as trimming back while you're busy refueling. And you can very definitely feel it. Oh yeah. This is a, this is a, an aerodynamics lecturer's dream because <laughs> this is the, uh, the, the this is the real deal. Yeah. You you're having to increase the thrust, increase the angle of attack, yes. and uh, the induced drag is going up the the full enchilada. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Lovely. And uh, it's only with practice that one gets that right. Often, once you've overcome all the hurdles of plugging you then get yourself into a pilot-induced oscillation as you take on fuel because you haven't anticipated the changes that happen. And you know from the stability lectures, if you have a fugoid, it normally damps itself, but this is a divergent thing. The pilot-induced oscillation somehow can't be sorted out. Once you start, you get out of phase with yourself. And I've seen many of my colleagues I haven't uh, had the pleasure of watching myself, mm. but it gets thrown out of the basket. Uh, just fun, not at So it will disengage. Yeah. But, but the, the best way to deal with PIO, pilot induced oscillation, is to let go of the stick. Yeah, that's quite right. You just you let go, or even momentarily, because you, you somehow can't fix it. The brain gets out of phase with, with what it's sensing. So you let go. Yeah. And then you come back gently. Well, normally what happens is you get thrown out of the basket and then you step back. And uh, you sit and calm down for a minute and try and recouple again. Now, let's say this thing is going perfectly well and you haven't, dis you haven't started oscillating, you haven't disengaged. How do you know when your tank is full or how do you know the time has come to for them to stop pumping and for you to disengage? So there, there are two scenarios. One, you, you request an amount of fuel. So you'll say request November 3000, then they set a, a tote for 3000 liters and it shuts off and you busy looking at the lights on the refueling pod and it goes from green to red and you know you're done. Or you ask for November max, which is full fuel. And once again, when the refueling, when it senses that that's it, you get a red light on the basket and you just slowly ease back on the power and disconnect and move off to the left hand side. And then the other, well, the number three will move in and eventually the number four as well. Yep. And then once it's all gone well, your whole formation is sitting on a holding point on the left hand side of the airplane and the exit procedure unlike the arrival procedure is now that you climb a thousand foot above the tanker and you may depart and go and do whatever you have to go and do. And it was very interesting looking through my logbook again because in the first two years uh, you have a look at your success rate I would record per session uh, two out of four or whatever though it was dismal on days. Uh, but then towards the last two years of the time that I was a two squadron, generally, it was a 100% success rate. I uh, refueled, I checked over 200 times. Over and, 200, uh, 200 times. times. It was, uh, we were really there at a wonderful time. We used to use it even for um, aerial combat training, which just made it all so much more effective. The, the cheetah, like any fighter, has never got enough fuel and uh, the, the air to air refueling changed the whole game for us. Thank you so much, Sean. A, a really fascinating subject. And I remember you talking to me about this, I don't know how many years ago, when this initiative came up, you know, the, the virtual flight school, I thought, man, people have got to hear about this. So thank you very, very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks, Scully.